Hi everyone, my name is X Paco and you are watching the BL Wiki and we are here with the cast and creator of My Extraordinary and I am super, super excited because this is me. I do not know anything about this thing that I'm gonna watch. Come come episode 8, I'm, I'm just this big mess. No, was <laughs> I wasn't part of it. Uh, emotional roller coaster this show has been and how much I've been able to relate. Let's go through the list of everyone we have right now. Vincent De Jesus. Hello, man. Hello, Kambang. <laughs> Screenwriter and songwriter. And oh, I, have a, right. uh, I have a partner actually, uh, Kenji Exalta Sean, wrote two of the songs and I did three. So, but he's the voice of. My extraordinary. He sang all the songs. Right, and I was yeah. talking yeah. at one point uh, how it was a great effect to me as a viewer having one voice for the entire show. Mm -hmm. As the entire show progressed, there was one character singing all of the songs. That was a big soundtrack impact, and I love that. Thank you, Vincent. Let's introduce the rest. Thank you. Also have Enzo Santiago. Hi, guys. Yes, I hello, can. mga kambengs. <laughs> we also have Darwin, you. Yes, hello. Um, good afternoon and yeah, hello, man. mga kambeng and pops. Yan, di ba? Me. Kailangan lahat mo magmeme. Yes, but hello po. Thank you so much for having us here. The more the merrier. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have Carissa. Hi, everyone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, what's up? The girl, everybody, the girl everybody loves to hate. <laughs> I'm so True. sorry, Carissa. Exactly. <laughs> I'm so sorry, personally. Uh, I mean... You've you've seen my you may have seen my reactions and I I personally apologize for any grief I may have caused you while you were watching. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. We also have Kevin Lee himself, KG Messina. Hello everyone. <laughs> me me me. <laughs> Hello <laughs> po sa inyong lahat. <laughs> Also, we have Philip Dola. Hi, Philip. Hi, guys. Hello, uh, my kambing. Hello, kambing. Hindi kambing Hindi kambing yun. Hindi kambing yun. Kambing pa ba yan? Kambing yun, kambing yun. Hybrid, hybrid. <laughs> and we have Caden Soriano. Say hi, Caden. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Caden Soriano and uh, also known as JV in my Extraordinary. So hello. Hello, everyone. Oh, my God. Who turned out the light? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Hello, hello, Super excited. Super excited to see these guys on my Zoom gallery uh, right now. Thank you for, so much for having us. And thank yeah, you so much. Here. So I've, I've got a lot of questions, some of which are a doozy. And I was talking about Vincent. I, I'm curious about a whole lot of things, but I really wanted to save some of them for the interview. Now, someone needs to tell me, what is this kambing thing that's going on? I feel like th this is not something I'm aware of. <laughs> what is that? Why is everyone maying? <laughs> I think it started with a, a fan or uh, a viewer. Because there's this line in the trailer when Monica says, what are you? And then Ken says, we're just friends. Friends friends don't run around, uh, roll on the grass like goats. Mga kaibigan na naghaharutan sa damuhan, ha? Ano ba kayo, kambeng? So, um, ano kayo mga kambeng? And then it started. For our uh, English-speaking viewers, guys, kambeng is basically goats. So, those are goats. So, every time you hear them, those are goat sounds, essentially. Yeah. And that's a reference to oh, yeah. that fateful and, episode. And it's cute that one, one viewer said, if Hi Hello Stranger has black sheep, <laughs> M-E-O has kambing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, yes. <laughs> 
So for the cast, this is something that I'm, I'm sure some of you have been asked, but I've, since some people are also coming upon you for the first time in this uh, interview, I would like to know, Kaden, how did you come upon the role and what were you doing before this? Well, for me, at first, uh, I didn't expect that Sir K will give me that that role because uh, in our contract, my upcoming project is just only a piece to remember. So I didn't expect that I will be the one who played JV in my Extraordinary because because. JV is not in real uh, in real storyline. Mm. JV is not included. So when when Sir K announced I will be the part of my extraordinary, then that was so uh, unexpected. <laughs> so before before I got the role, maybe I am just working that time. That's an interesting Easter egg. That's the kind of thing that fans like to hear, right? So basically, your character was retroactively added into the script. You yeah. you were for a script earlier on uh, for another show, but then you were folded back into My Extraordinary. That's interesting. Thank you so much for that, Kaden. Yeah. Carissa, well, what as- about you? Hey. Um, well, as for me, I started attending workshops when I was 16 years old, I think. That was 2016. Then I stopped for a year, around 2018. Then I started attending some castings and auditions but I was lucky enough to, to land the role but I was lucky because Sir Christian Kabigking offered me my extraordinary. Philip, how did you come across the role and what were you doing before this? Um, same to what uh, Kaden said. Originally I was I was supposed to be on A Kiss to Remember but luckily for me and Kaden uh, we were given the chance to play uh, a role in my extraordinary, which is Kevin and JV. Before being Kevin, I guess is that what I can say. Uh, before being Kevin, I was uh, preparing myself to start college. What are you taking up? Tourism, like Darwin. KG, what about you? Oh my you? gosh. <laughs> uh, I met Sir Christian uh, before. Like Chris, I also uh, attended workshops. That's the first time that I met Sir Christian. And after workshop, I tried to work to Sir Christian. I became a PA, personal assistant and our, our, our road manager of his artist. But he tries to help me, like giving me some projects also, even if I'm working with him. Then there is a time that uh, I really want to stop acting. So this is the time. This pandemic, uh, this year, I go back to my family on my mom's side. And I started doing uh, business. So during that time, I'm trying to figure things out. And suddenly, uh, there's this uh, thing happened in my life that is not uh, really, really happy. So you, you know what's funny? Because... Uh, when Sir Christian texted me, I was drinking that night because I'm, I'm very sad, I'm lonely. I don't know what am I going to do now in my life. But as in, in a snap, she, uh, he just uh, texted me like, KG, you're going to play heaven on my extraordinary. Like, uh, what? Is this real, Sir Christian? Yeah, you have to attend this. And, yeah. and I was surprised. And in that moment, I thank God because, you know, it, I feel like, I am very blessed. God doesn't leave me, doesn't leave us, actually. Like, He picked me in the right moment. Like, I was, I was giving up that moment, but, you know, God is good. And I, I thank uh, Sir Christian, I thank Sir Vincent, I thank everyone for giving me a chance to portray heaven in my extraordinary. And good news, uh, like what Sir Vincent said, there's a lot of projects coming to my extraordinary cast. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear. That's a, that's I, I keep saying this to everybody I'm talking with. This pandemic specifically has been, you know, crap for a lot of people. And uh, BLs in many, many ways have been our way of coping. It was a way for some of you to also cope. And now you, here you are. With, you, you are stars of the show. And you are helping other people out there by being mirrors of their story. Right. So in, in the same way, you are thankful to production. I am thankful to you guys, yes. you and your yes. characters, your actors, because you guys were the mirrors. You guys were the essentially prisms of everyone's LGBT experience. And that's a, such a big deal, I feel like. Darwin, what about you? 
Yes, um, same with them. I started in Star Magic Workshop way back 2014 and in the film. So that's where I met Sir Christian Kabigting. And then uh, fast forward, January, I think, um, an extraordinary news came to me. And yes, and this is where Sir K told me that I will have a series, but he didn't say um, it, it is a boys' love series. Um, and I really don't have any idea about boys' love that time. And then he just told me that I will play a lead role. And of course, I after all the hiatus, um, I'm so happy and thankful for that. Enzo, what about you? Before my extraordinary, I was as a struggling and a young actor. I was like uh, trying to find the uh, auditions and of course uh, doing workshops under Star Magic. And mm-hmm. I've had uh, multiple like uh, realizations before the my extraordinary that. Uh, is my re- career going to be successful being an ar- being an artista in the Philippines? So yeah, at first I was about to give up because I, I I thought to myself that I should finish my studies first before pursuing this field of work. So then uh, my extraordinary came into my life. Sir K came into my life, and he offered me this uh, contract to be part with the with the Arts Asterisk Digital Entertainment family, and MEO was the first project in line for me. And yeah, I was really excited for it because just when I was about to give up, a new blessing came for me. And this was my extraordinary. And the name was very fitting for this experience because it was really extraordinary. This experience was something that I will always cherish and remember. And this is something that I think has been a, a stepping stone for my career because I really mm-hmm. wanted to do acting since I was a kid. I wanted to be... In the movies, like uh, our idols in those pictures, and yeah, I think uh, everything is uh, coming into real- reality right now. And though my extraordinary has ended, I think it is just the beginning for me and my co-artist here in the Asterisk Digital family. You know what's interesting about the BL genre? I don't know if you guys are going to agree with this or not, but I feel like the BL genre is this very very strange phenomenon where the world is so ready to accept whatever it is you're going to throw at them you just literally give them a title and I- i'm sure you guys know this um you didn't even have the trailer yet people were already talking about my extraordinary um you were uh, the cast announcement came out People were like, okay, I want to watch that. That's not something that you can say of other genres. That's why I was saying this um, in a previous interview that I had. The thing with BLs is the, the world is basically ready to hand you your microphone and it's it's up to you to make something of it, right? Vincent, what was the driving force? You've already worked on a lot of stuff before, but what was your driving force to work on My Extraordinary or BLs in general? Uh... Just like everyone from uh, Enzo to Darwin and the rest of the cast, I was called uh, by Christian mid-June, June 14 to be exact, and asked me to... I've known Christian from Star Magic. We've been friends for quite a while, from I think 10, 15 years, because I used to teach uh, Star Magic. And Christian asked, can you come over tomorrow to give two of our actors an afternoon of acting workshop? Yeah, I thought about it because it, it was just GCQ. It was like a, a few days GCQ, so people were like afraid to go out. But I said, where is this? It's just across ABS at Cornerstone. Thing. Okay. And then right, right there, they, I saw Darwin and Enzo for the first time with their masks. And we read through the script social distancing <laughs> we can't really touch each other so it is kind of weird but it is fun and Carissa followed after after the session after that we had a discussion about the script and one thing led to another and finally me and my big mouth Christian said Sir Vince why don't you write the script for the series we go okay okay so <laughs> Of course, who would say no? I mean, we're not doing it. I mean, I'm just staring at the ceiling for the past several months. So, so I accepted the challenge and we talked about it with Derek Jolo, with Christian. So, And then I gave him a storyline. And then mm-hmm. Christian said, but someone has to be a ghost. I said, shoot. 
Il est tard. Mais même il est tard. Je me dis, well, there has to be a ghost. But I like it. And, and then, and then from the onset, I said, I don't want one ghost. I want two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's so many stories that one, there's a pair and then one dies and one suffers, one wants to go back. I said, why not if they both die? Mm-hmm. We, we just basically use the, the ghost element to navigate the narrative, which is basically homophobia. Because if we kill them, I kill them at episode three, I don't want them not to be there on six, seven, and eight because they're, they're shaken. So I just had to find a device that you'll see them until the end of the series. But being able to do that requirement, which is somebody has to be a ghost. So, but basically, it's not a ghost story. It's actually more of a psychological drama. And then Kevin's role and Caden's role, I said, if there's a season two, let's introduce the character of Caden. And from the very beginning of MEO, we knew that season two will be a continuation of My Extraordinary. And so we had to introduce JV's character and mm-hmm. the rest. So you don't have to start from zero on season two. And then you have familiar faces. You can latch on beginning of episode. So you won't really be lost and you don't start over again because you've invested emotions with the previ- uh, from the previous season. I became the writer. I also became the musical scorer and a song composer along with Genji Exaltation. I mean, we are in a very, very, very Catholic, very conservative country. And that is, you know, addressed head on by, uh, by the show. My Extraordinary, but you as actors, were there any obstacles that you had to face, any conflicts, external or whatever, that you encountered when when you wanted to join My Extraordinary and given the fact that it's going to be a BL? I mean, w- did anyone try to stop you or whatever? For, for conflicts, uh, for my family, there are no conflicts with them. My mom agrees with this role and... Of course, my sister too, because we are only three in this family right now. And yeah, I've done, I've done a LGBTQ film before. So I think this is also the reason why mom, my mom understands this kind of genre, VL. And yeah, she's very supportive in my endeavors. And I'm, I just can't say how happy and proud I am of my mother. Because she's the real motivation of the Enzo Santiago. About my peers... Well, somehow, um, my friends are messing around with me sometimes. Like, they are saying that I'm, I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay like that. And yeah, uh, I do understand them because they are kidding around. And I, I can feel their support, especially from my uh, very close friends. And that is also the reason why I wanted to do this BL uh, film because... I wanted to change that kind of perception towards the LGBTQIA themed films that you shouldn't use the word gay as a word to kid around, like um, a word to use to bully someone. It shouldn't be a word that is used to, to make fun of. Uh, also, why I wanted to do this. And I was motivated because my real friends that and my loved ones that are so close to me are the ones who wanted to push me to do this role because they believe that I can do this and they believe in my capabilities as an actor. And yeah, I'm just thankful for them. So I was talking earlier about how acting was gonna, was supposed to be a thing that I was going to do. You're lucky, Enzo, because your mom, your mom is supporting you. But my mom, she said, you can do anything but play a gay character. You can be a Nazi. For all I care, you can play a serial killer, but you cannot be a gay character. And I see Vincent laughing, right? That's that's hilarious, right? Oh. I mean, my mom would rather yeah. be, a, be a killer in a horror movie than, <laughs> than a gay character. So in your case, Enzo, you are you are very lucky to have your mom, I would say. Maybe because we, we also have relatives that are part of the LGBTQ community. And my mom is someone that care so much about 
her relatives. And I think, in a way, she became very understanding because I saw my uncle cry to my mom because of his gender identity or expression. And I think my mom believes that the LGBTQ community should be accepted. And mm. it, is, it isn't something that is to be shunned. You shouldn't be judged because of your gender expression or identity. That's awesome. That's awesome. Darwin, what about you? Yes, uh, for me, it felt surreal, of course, but yet challenging. It's something new. And I came from a Chinese family. It's a traditional Chinese family. So some of my relatives didn't support me here. And some of my friends didn't support me also. But I'm thankful because uh, my parents and my sisters, they supported me and they are they understand that this is what I want. This is what I really want to, to work on. This is my passion. I'm acting. Mm-hmm. I use some of my friends. I have a lot of good friends that are part of the LGBTQIA+. And mm-hmm. same with Enzo. There's also a lot of people using gay as an insult. I use them as a motivation and use my friends to be an inspiration to everyone about their story, of course. Um, because um, the LGBTQIA has a story to tell. And mm-hmm. everyone should hear about that. That's my motivation. You guys are re- really insightful. I appreciate it. I'm not going to ask any spoilery questions again because number one, we don't really know if we're even going to spoil because we don't know where the story is going. But I guess... I do. Uh, I do somehow. <laughs> but I guess my next <clears throat> question, we are not going to talk about where uh, A Kiss to Remember is going to go in terms of the possibilities of love angle because number one, we don't want to spoil. Number two, we might not really know where it's going yet. But Caden and Philip, if ever, I'm, and I'm sure um, just being in a BL, you've also encountered some level of resistance as well, right? Um, did you encounter any of that from friends, family? Let me go with... Caden first. None of my relatives, rather my uh, family, uh, against with that because first of all, my relatives and my uh, my family are they are open in that uh, kind of situation. Uh, my mom and dad uh, always support me and they they always cheer me up before before the taping. And actually, my friends also because they are the one who inspires me also. And I have a relative which is my uncle. He is uh, part of LGBTQA. What about Philip? Same as Kaden, I think, because my family supports me in this journey and they gave me a reminder regarding what I could possibly face when I do this or some of the things uh, that might happen. But after all, it's for a good cause, right? So there's nothing wrong with do- doing this because you know it's going to be for a good cause. That's my uh, decision. I think this is my uh, help to my friends, to my family who who are member of the LGBT community. I think this is one good thing I can do for them. Can I just say uh, I'm just we are I I feel fortunate. We feel fortunate for these young actors that um, they were raised by very understanding families. They're very lucky and they're very fortunate, and they grew up. I know that they're they're say, they're not just saying it because I've been with them for a, quite a while, and I know they mean every word they say. And I'm just happy that, you know, there's a next generation, particularly them, whose hearts are very open and not judgmental, and which really <laughs> touch. No, it means re- a lot because there's hope from the next generation that. There will be less hate in I hope, um, after uh, but, more love and less hate and um, that's that's exactly what I'm thinking. I'm like yeah. I, I keep throwing it back to my experience and how different it was. And yes, yes. there's that element of I, why couldn't it have been like this back back then? But but at the same mm-hmm. time, when you think about it, moving forward, the world is a better place, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Okay, I know so, it's yeah. a privilege. Yeah, I know it's a privilege for some of them because they're, uh, especially the guys are straight guys, and it's a privilege to play a gay character, and they know the responsibility of telling somebody else's story, using their truth. I mean, every story can be told them using your own truth. So that's the job of an actor. Right. And 
and they did it really, really, really well. And should I say? Okay, so for Vincent, you mentioned that to me that the songs really tied together with the story, and it's very obvious. And that essentially they're two halves of the puzzle. So how did that come together for you? Because because I was telling you about how it to me it felt like, and I mentioned this to you. I don't mean this in a negative way. It felt very much. It reminded me of my old K drama classic affinity for Winter Sonata, and yeah. how the the so there was one singer for the entire soundtrack, and his voice. Uh, reverberated throughout the entire story and reflected, you know, the experiences of the characters. And it seems like that's what you were going for as well in this show. How did that come together for you? As a composer with the songs, it was clear to me that I wanted one voice for the whole season. Not just because Kenji has a beautiful singing voice and is a very sensitive singer, but he takes his voice takes over the narrative of Ken, Shake, Monica, Sandy. He's the voice of everyone. It's like the unseen narrator. In the first episode, it was Ken's voice you hear as the narrator, and somehow Kenji takes over in the form of a song, and then he synthesizes the emotion, underlines it, underscores it to to prove the point even further make mm-hmm. it more dramatic and make sure that it doesn't fly over our heads and it's a powerful tool to push the narrative further because the emotion becomes stronger because there's a song and then you have fine acting from the cast so it was very conscious it was a conscious effort for us to have one singer and we i think we made the right decision And it and it was Kenji also. And I think you know, just speaking from a final final recipient of product, right? It worked. <laughs> it worked so well. Yeah, yeah. The, the acting is fine, and I guess I wrote it in a way that helps help their character. And then you hear the musical score, which is very subliminal and subject. It doesn't really attract attention. Hey, listen to us. Listen to me, listen to the music, but it's just there to support. And yeah, it, they carried each other pretty well. And then you have the song to end it. So. And I think I will want a little bit of your input on this as well, Vincent. But this is more of an Enzo question. What was in the headspace of Ken when he was falling for shape? Because it was gradual, right? And the thing is, there seemed to be comments, um, even from heaven... Even from you know, there were always comments here and there from people, but they seem to just brush it off, and he just they, they they kind of were like in a world of their own, right? And what was in 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 the character's mind as as that relationship was developing, despite all of the side comments from Mike and Sandy, it, it seemed like he brushed all of those aside. What were you, what were you thinking as a character? Before I answer that. I asked uh, Sir Vincent a question about being uh, an LGBTQIA member. I asked, uh, when did you know you like uh, your same uh, same sex peers like me? I, I liked uh, Darwin. Sir Vincent said that when was the first time that you liked a girl, and the answer to that is the same to a LGBTQIA person. That was all in my mind when I was uh, portraying a scan that. I know that I really like Shake, and I think this was the time that Ken was ready to show out his true feelings for himself and his loved ones, like uh, Shake. I was like uh, pursuing Shake not just for the for the name of love, but also for myself as Ken. That I want to love him freely, freely, and mm. it's like a uh, no boundaries. Even though my friends are saying and telling me that no, I cannot love him, no, I cannot because I I am I'm, I'm like this. I am Ken. Mm-hmm. I was like brushing off those those thoughts, and I I only pursued what was on my heart, and it was to get the love from Shake, get the love mm-hmm. that I'm longing for, ever since I was a kid. Because I I think Ken has grown up from a very traditional family, as you can see from my mom, mommy Monica. That she's uh, she always tells me that why haven't you have been together with Sandy? Like Sandy is really good for you. She knows you 
from the very beginning. She's my neighbor for like uh, so many years and I've known her so much. Why don't you pursue her? And yeah, I was like deep inside uh, my thoughts. Mom, you know who I am. That was all in my, uh, in my mind and uh, I pursued that. I pursued that thought that uh, no person can tell me whom, whom I should love. I don't, I don't know if you, because Vincent got to watch my reaction video, but essentially, I, 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 this is weird because I, I feel like I'm talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah. because Ken's character is me, essentially. Yeah. Especially, yeah. Yeah, that that's that was essentially me. I was I was a mama's boy in a, in the best sense of the word, in the same way that Ken was. And uh, it, you know, all of that. It, that's why even just hearing you talk about it now, I feel like almost crying because the, the way you said it, you just wanted to love Shake freely. And you know, the funny thing, this story, this story, my extraordinary. If it was, if there was no homophobia, and no conflict, it would have had a happy ending. It would. Might, might have even made for a dull romantic show and nobody would have noticed, right? Because because it's normal. But the, the problem is the evil is homophobia exists. And sometimes it's within our own families and they don't even know that they're the villains in our lives because they're not villains. They're not. Yeah. It's, they're it's, not. it's yeah. what's within them that they don't realize that they're actually affecting their children this way. So even hearing you talk about that makes me want to cry and I have to remember that this is not a reaction video. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not supposed to react. <laughs> Just so you know, I, I really appreciated the fact that you played that character that way. And thank you. You literally were portraying my character. And that thing you were saying where, you know, you were being pawned off to Sandy, right? My yeah. mom was doing that. My mom was doing that. You know, you why don't you uh, why don't you date this girl? She's a nice Christian girl, and you're very close. I feel like you'd make a good couple. And in, in my head, I'm like, yeah, mom, you know that's never gonna happen. Hello, so all of that, mom, hello. and I was watching hello. it happen. <laughs> I was watching it happen on screen. So that's what made it extra painful and extra poignant. Basically, what I wrote about Ken, not just Ken, about Shake, all the characters, in a way, happened to me in real life. Mm -hmm. People call it trope, but right. tropes, are, tropes are basically events that happen over and over again. Strangers fall in love because they're strangers. And they mm -hmm. know each other, and then they fall in love. In this case, about Ken seemingly aggressive, he was very aggressive pursuing Shake. But he was completely unaware that he was pursuing Sheikh, completely oblivious of his surroundings, because it was he was that passionate about Sheikh. What about Sheikh? Probably him being mysterious. He doesn't know anything about Sheikh. He's probably the opposite of Ken. And then when Sheikh opened up that he's alone by himself, probably something sparked in Ken. Oh my God, he's alone. The more he needs me, the more. Yeah. He, he needs affection. And Sheikh, as a person, has been alone for the longest time, abandoned by the father. The mother died at an early age. He's dying for attention. Mm -hmm. He's longing for attention all his life. And finally, here comes uh, Ken. But at first, he was kind of brushing it off, uh, seeming like when, he, when Ken called him up, of course, there was Kilik, but it says, Okay, you got me into trouble, Ken. So I'll play a game with you. How how badly do you want me? So <laughs> they naturally gravitated towards each other without them knowing it. People have asked me, how come they they have a relation? It's not where's the label? They're not talking about it. Experience wise, when I talk about it, it gets ruined. <laughs> Just play it out, and then I ask. We're in the middle, and all I think about is this person. That's when I tell him. And I don't mean this in any negative way, but KG's character, Heaven, was a wonderful frame of that, I think. Yeah. I, actually, that leads me to my next question, which is for KG. Because the thing is, Heaven is an out and proud LGBT member of the community. We, we, the character is part of the Bakla community, correct? Yes. Yeah, so... And when he observes uh, this thing going on with Sheikh and Ken, he's like, hmm, what's going on there? And he starts to try to kind of 
put labels on it as well. What was going on in your head when you were observing that relationship develop as a character? Because I'm the best friend of, uh, of Sheik. So I know even if he didn't tell me who he, he is, I, as, a, as his best friend, I know what's going on. <clears throat> Being a friend of, of Sheik, I, I, I think that, that the time that I saw Sheik and Ken, I felt happy for Sheik because, you know, I, I'm a supportive friend that now my friend is spreading his wings. And as a friend, I want my, my best friend to be happy, you know, to be who he is. That moment when I saw Shake and Ken, I, I'm really, really proud of him. I, I'm this kind of friend in real life also. Every time I, I saw my friend uh, happy to what he is or what she is, uh, I'm just here to support him. Yeah. Okay, so for Darwin, uh, so Sheik is like uh, like Vincent said, he's very much this alone, aloof guy who was thrown into a very sudden, very positive, very loving relationship that he was, you know, not ready for, as the song says, and that he didn't expect. How did you navigate that as an actor? We all knew that Sheik is a loner, not because he wanted to be alone, to be alone, but because of his experiences in life. And same with me as my character because there's a lot of pain as Darwin knew. And I can tell it to everyone. And of course, um, I can share it to everyone. I need to face it on my own. Same as Shake. As long as he can do it, as long as he, he needs to be strong, he will hide all his pain in life. Maybe because he is alone. And he thinks that no one will understand him. No one will hear his story. Um, it's really easy to inject the commonality of Shake and Darwin you in terms of pain. So that was your who got. All right, so I, I want to ask, this one is uh, for Carissa. Um, I remember that there, there was this whole discussion about Sandy and Monica are not villains. And yeah. yeah, I know it was a tough role to portray and I understand that, but there were two very distinct points. There were two distinct moments in time where outright, there was a scene with, uh, with Heaven where he basically said, I'm not just going to let this whole thing go on by, right? And then, mm. but moments, a few days later, she comes to te- terms with Ken and Shake and even actually is the one to help bring them together. How did your character make it from point A to point B? We didn't really get to see it from your point of view, right? Because um, Sandy is a secondary character, being a, that she's a secondary character. It has to be more internal. Um, there was a point where she was definitely, she was sure, this is not my fault. I, d- I didn't do this. But then she switches to, you know what? I feel like I, I am now okay with this. Maybe I can help bring these two together. I have the ability to do that. How did you navigate? I think Sandy, she doesn't hate Ken for being gay. That's like how I understood my character as Sandy. She doesn't okay. hate Ken for being gay. She, it's more like she felt like um, sad and lonely that why can't it be her? And then she was caught up with all the emotions going on with her mom, with her dad, and then Ken. So she felt all this emotion which led her to snitching to Ken's mom. But deep down, I don't think Sandy plans to out him. It's just that he, she wants confirmation on, on, what's, on what's Ken doing, which she's not in control of because... Ken isn't replying to her. But in the end, she kind of felt guilty because she knows deep down, partly she, she's, she's one of the reasons why Ken died and Shake mm. died also. If, you, if you're the kind of person who follows mm. cause and effect, it feels like, you know, it is kind of Sandy and Monica's fault. I mean, it's not, obviously, because Ken was the one who chose to go home. Sandy was not driving that truck that hit them. Right? But because of the cause and effect, you, you, you end up blaming yourself as a character. Yeah. 